Okay, so I think we're sort of bifurcating now a bit from having talked about Chartism in London. I'm going to talk about London, and then Ian is going to talk about Chartism. But for my paper, we're going to jump back about 40 years to around 1800, um, when this map of London by Richard Horwood was completed. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the map as I go through, but this is sort of a paper about different genres and how they represent London differently. So I was interested in how literary representations of London might be mapped and found actually that lots of literature is extremely sceptical and non-specific about London in this period. So I started to look at topographical accounts and other sorts of things. Um, so I'm going to read a slightly more formal paper and look at how topographical representations and poetic representations of London um, clash using the map as a, a means of looking at that. So in the 18th and early 19th century, writers producing the kinds of work which we would now call literary are often very sceptical about London. Percy Shelley, whose poems enjoyed considerable currency among Chartist audiences, they were regularly printed in the Northern Star, constructed a considerable part of Peter Bell III around what for the city is a very unflattering comparison. Hell is a city very much like London, a populous and smoky city. There are all sorts of people undone, and there is little or no fun done, small justice shown, and still less pity. While earlier in the 18th century, poems such as John Gay's Trivia had been able to dwell entirely within the bounds of London and found a great deal that was positive to say about the city, late 18th and early 19th century liter literary works commonly only dipped into the metropolis, finding the task of systematising either too daunting or not to their tastes. The London poetry and London poets of the early 18th century to a large extent fell away. It was not really until the 1820s with work like Piers Egan's Life in London and new periodical forms like Charles Lamb's Elia essays that writers of literary prose definitively took up the 19th century city as their subject. Francis Burney's heroine Evelina circles into London twice to see two quite different sides of the metropolis, but the city ultimately serves as a place of education through which she must pass rather than as a final destination. William Godwin's Caleb Williams flees into the city, or more properly into Southwark, south of the river, um, but finds there only temporary and melancholy sack from which he's soon dragged away. William Wordsworth spends most of a book of the prelude dealing with his residence in London, but does so manage which often deflect away or recoil from the city's profusion. While Samuel Taylor Coleridge was reared in the great city, Pentamit Cloisters Dim, as he puts it in Frost at Midnight, this was not what he, where he hoped his son Hartley would find that great universal teacher who should mould his spirit. When he imagined his, his friend, gentle-hearted Charles Lamb, from his lime tree bower, Coleridge sees him as someone who's pined and hunger after nature many a year in the great city pent, winning thy way with sad yet patient soul through evil and pain and strange calamity. London here is a blockage rather than a solution, a failure of connections rather than a place of fruitful exchange, something that must be overcome rather than a community which sustains. This literary negativity towards London speaks to the difficulty of representing the burgeoning city faithfully within the context of the limited personal modes of consciousness which were becoming prevalent in poetry and fiction as both became increasingly interested in, in inner lives. London's size at the end of the 18th century was both unprecedented and problematic. In the late 1780s, the population of Manchester was around 40,000. In 1791, the population of Edinburgh and Leith was 81,865, and in 1800, the population of Birmingham was about 74,000. London had a population of over a million, rising considerably during the sittings of Parliament to around 1.2 million. So it was 12 times larger than the largest other settlement, or largest next settlement in Britain, and by a considerable distance the biggest city in Europe. It's about twice the size of Paris, its nearest rival at this point. London thus presented a new kind of representational challenge, which I would contend it took novelists and poets a considerable time fully to engage with. However, increasingly specialist literary forms of writing were not the only sorts of works which ought to deal with the metropolis. Looking at other visual and textual forms of representation can tell us a great deal about the city in the period and about the kinds of discourses which the versifiers and novelers, novelists sought to define themselves against. Disaffected poetic and fictional accounts wrote back against a wave of topographical antiquarian accounts which were increasingly seeking to glorify the city in various ways. Samuel William Fawes's New Guide for Foreigners, a dual-language French and English publication produced around 1789 and sold opposite the Paris Diligence Office, so actually probably to people fleeing the French Revolution, is fairly typical in its listing the city's vast consumption, recording that annually London has got through 1,113,500 barrels of strong beer, 789,700 ditto of small beer, 32,500 tonnes of wine and 
11,146,700 gallons of rum, brandy, Geneva, etc. Um, I did the calculation just for the spirits. That puts the average consumption of spirits in London about five shots a day, and that's before you put the beer. Um, so I think there's something interesting you can draw from those sorts of accounts about the levels of drunkenness, which must have been prevalent within the catalogue if those numbers are accurate. The guide lists the amount of game, poultry, etc. consumed in London as beyond the reach of calculation. London scale here becomes somehow glorious rather than alienating. Its excess is a token of distinction. While poems and novels saw London size as obstructive, its scale is almost impossible to represent. Uh, other accounts commonly saw its vast scope as an opportunity. The advertisement to the 1804 for Modern London, public, uh, probably by its publisher Richard Phillips, claimed that his book would exhibit the very soul of the metropolis. Most of the busy haunts of the inhabitants, whether for the gratification of ambition, avarice or pleasure, have been exactly portrayed, and these views convey at once correct ideas of places which interest from their celebrity and of scenes which characterise the manners of the people. While Phillips, in this account, um, does not claim that London's soul is by any means pure, he does contend that it is graspable, that the city can be characterised and understood, rendered down into a comprehensible and useful written form. He was by no means alone in this. There's a flourishing market at this period, um, books of London antiquities and series of plates of London views. I'll show some of these in a moment. If the poets no longer loved London in verse as they had once done, it was certainly not a city without its tributes. So one of the most impressive attempts to encompass London at the end of the 18th century was this. The plan of the cities of London, Westminster, the borough of Southwark, parts adjoining, showing every house, produced at considerable financial and personal expense between 1790 and 1799 by the surveyor Richard Horwood. And this is a British Library co uh, copy from the press collection, um, which has been coloured. Um, the details of Horwood's life are pretty scant. Uh, it's not really clear when he was born. He's recorded being baptised at the Church of St Mary in Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire, on the 26th of March, 1758. There's some evidence of his early surveying um, in plans of Trentham Hall in Staffordshire, um, a project which he conducted for his older brother, Thomas. But after that, um, he vanishes for a number of years. Um, various scholars have conjectured that he might have worked for the Phoenix Fire Office, for whom he, to whom he later dedicates the map. One sec. There is a dedication in the bottom corner there, roughly where the hand is, to the Phoenix Fire Office. Um, which later provided him with a loan to support his work. Um, there you go. Um, but there's no real evidence of this beyond the dedication. It's possible that he's the Richard Horwood who operated as a china dealer uh, in glass enamelled blue edged in Queensware from 431 The Strand in the 1780s. Um, this again is using British Library newspaper collections to look up Richard Horwood's. Um, a notice of his auction of his stock in the world for the 26th of November 1790 describes this Richard Horwood as a wholesale and retail dealer. It also states that he is quitting that trade, having engaged in a work of great public utility under the patronage of persons of the first rank and consequence. So that lines up very neatly with the first records of when Horwood's trying to get subscribers to the plan, which is also in, I think, October 1790. So this might be the work of great public utility for which that Richard Horwood leaves his former profession. In many ways, though, the best evidence for Hall's London existence in the 1790s is the plan itself, um, uh, which includes his successes and frustrations. This is the interior of the tower. You'll see he's marked there. The internal parts are not shown, or not distinguished, being refused permission to take the survey. Um, he also includes, next, in fact, to the dedication to the Phoenix Fire Office, an explanation which explains why he wasn't able to carry out his full original scheme. The public, he writes, will observe that there are many streets, etc., where numbers are omitted, such as either without numbers or so very irregularly and frequently changed that they could not, with propriety, be inserted. So the mutability of London thus outran the ability of its chronicler to set it in stone. While Howard is not able to gather every detail which he'd sought to include, the plan as it stands is a testament to success at accruing information and finding ingenious ways of accommodating it. Um, the material object contains direct and tacit evidences of Horwood's walking London's many streets, um, taking careful notes and surveys, his consulting people of all ranks and stations and gathering written sources in order to confirm names and bought numbers, his negotiations with printers, engravers and subscribers, um, his buying the specially watermarked paper on which the plan was printed. You cannot see the watermark on the digital version. So that's one of the things that gets lost in digitization. Uh, so but there are losses as well as gains. Um, uh, and his working painstakingly by sun and candlelight with pencil, compasses and rule in hand to recreate metropolis in miniature. 
writing to the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce in 1800 as part of a series of attempts to um, secure a premium in relation to his work. The plan had a, a long list of subscribers, but he was constantly short of money in producing it. Um, after finishing the plan, he did another plan of Liverpool, and then he died in penury in 1803. And then a more successful map proprietor bought the plan and revised it a few times and made a lot more money off it. Um, anyway, in his letter, he claimed that the execution of the plan has cost me nine years severe labour and indefatigable perseverance, and these years form the most valuable part of my life. Um, I took every angle, measured almost every line, um, and after that plotted and compared the whole work. The engraving, considering the immense mass of work, is, I flatter myself, well done. So I found out that Howard's plan existed at the beginning of this year. Its beauty and its interest as an object and its potential for exploring the romantic city made it my entry point to thinking about ways in which we can digitally reconstruct London's patterns and interact with its remains in new ways. So the physical plan is 32 sheets. You can sort of see the edges of the sheets there where the colours change slightly. Um, it's sort of going from the middle of Hyde Park in the west to Limehouse in the east, southern edge of Islington in the north to the southern fringes of Kennington and Woolworth in the south. If you put together the physical version, which I have done most of in the maps reading room, it's about 13 feet across and 7 feet high. Um, this makes it rather unwieldy to use. Um, uh, so I decided to see if I could create a digital version, map it over the modern city. So this map, which is on romanticlondon.org, is also mapped over if the tiles will pop in. Google satellite imagery, the Google road map, and open street map. Um, so you can compare the two. Um, and annotate it to bring other texts from the period in conversation to it. So this is, if we will switch windows here. That will come in, but there's a series of guides here that um, that show places. So the the greens are the locations from Fawzi's guide, new guide for foreigners. The blue are the images from the microcosm of London. So if you click on those, those will pop up. Um, and um, the other markers are from Richard Phillips One London, which I mentioned earlier, and we'll return to in a second. Um, so reducing the map to the size of a box on a computer monitor while still allowing you to see every detail via zooming in, um, something that's only really become possible in the past few years. Um, similarly, if you tried to pin text and images to the plan in the pre-digital era, you would probably rightly ended up dealing with furious librarians. Um, while the London of the period has to a large extent slipped away, digital technologies have opened up a number of avenues for re-envisioning and democratising the traces which remain. So the current Romantic London website includes plates from Rudolf Ackerman's Microcosm of London, uh, the plates and texts from Richard Phillips's Modern London. So this is the images and pools from that with the description. Um, and these are it's one of the plates of the itinerant trades, if we can. Sorry, there we go. That's, um, which are also from the same book. Um, text from New Guide for Foreigners and the text from the 1788 edition of Harris's List of Covent Garden Ladies. Um, so you can visit the site and you can see all of those things at the moment, and I'm hoping to continue to expand it. So Romantic Period London, as Horwood's plan and the intertext which I pinned to it eloquently demonstrate, was a prospect both radically and conservatively different from any other contemporary urban or rural environment in Britain. Its quantitative scale mandated, mandated qualitative differences which encompassed systems and complexities which had not yet developed or which were deemed unnecessary in less extensive urban environments. London had long been a city of professional associations from the medieval guilds to the inns of court and the training hospitals. The late 18th and early 19th century was also the location where many modern disciplines and professions were first fully articulated. Where provincial literary and philosophical societies were generally and necessarily broad churches, London institutions were becoming more didactic and specialised, incentivised more tightly to define their limits by competition, by the possibilities of overwhelmed. So while the model of sociability in the provinces is a group of people meeting together to discuss a wide range of matters, in, in London you first get the lecturing institution where one person stands in front of a large group and declaims to them. Um, as the capital of London's the default location for most of the sort of nas self-consciously national organisations, so the antiquarians who write on London history are part of the Society of Antiquaries, the higher class visual artists who illustrate London are members of the Royal Academy. The book trades concentrated in the capital along Paternoster Row behind St Paul's Cathedral, around there, um, along the Strand where Ackerman's own shop, um, the, the repository of the arts is, I think, in Fel Felwell's former accommodation. Um, and. Um, in the fashionable West End where houses like John Murray are based. Um, so that a lot of these lavish illustration versions of London are produced by London publishers and are only producible within London where the printing expertise is, um, is present. It's also interesting that lots of them are publisher-driven rather than author-driven. So Fawz's new guide is named for its publisher, as is Ackerman's Microcosm and Phillips's Modern London. 
So they're designed as useful and beautiful objects of consumption, but they're produced in a means that's quite a sort of mode that's quite difficult, different from the modes of those who are uh, creating poetry and novels. Poets and novelists are still at this point quite heavily reliant on older systems of social recognition, including direct and indirect patronage. Which and that means they really want to be distinct as individuals rather than as cogs in mercantile systems. Um, newer uh, sort of proto-romantic ideologies about aesthetics and individual genius also don't really fit into the sorts of ways in which these accounts of London are being produced. Authoring selves for, was for many writers a key part of poetry and fiction. While London systems can serve for the promotion of selves, um, the expanding city is a pretty hostile environment for trying to establish your distinction. Far better to define yourself in opposition to it in certain ways than to try and be part of it. So while writers representing London in the late 18th and early 19th centuries can't really be divided crudely into camps of alienated literary individualists and positivist purveyors of commercial proto-modernity in themselves, it's striking how much more keen poets and novelists are about London in their letters rather than their published fiction. There do seem to be significant difference in the ways that different genres of works represented London. These appear for, to me to open up sometime in the 18th century and to begin to close again by the 1820s. Um, and I'll just, in the last part of this paper, spend a little bit of time comparing some of these. So the poem that's now the most famous romantic period meditation on London, and perhaps the most famous poem on London full stop, is not very sanguine about the city. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every quiet eye of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and how the sapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So Williams Blake's vision of London, probably one that's not entirely out of keeping with certain Chartist visions of London, um, is one of a city which feeds upon the weak and the vulnerable. Power represented through evoking the city's regulations, but also associated with the facades of its grandest buildings, oppresses human victims who are universally weakened and restrained through existing within the metropolis. There is very little community in Blake's London. Instead, the poem turns on isolation and divisions. The social ills which Blake discerns were not unacknowledged in other genres. This will load up in a sec. Richard Phillips' Lord in London depicts its chimney sweeper here outside the walls of the founding hospital and the plate description is very clear about the abuses of the trade. The hard conditions of chimney sweeping devolves upon the smallest and feeblest of the children apprenticed from the parish workhouses. The employment in itself stints their growth, and it is unhappily too much the interest of the master so to feed his apprentices as they shall not be liable to outgrow their occupation. It is very common to see chimney sweepers of 12 and 14 years of age who do not exceed the ordinary stature of boys of seven and eight. In 1800, Patrick Colquhoun, a statistician, one of the pioneers of modern policing, estimated that London contained about 50,000 women who worked as prostitutes, or about a tenth of the female population, um, many of whom seemed to have no alternative but to become the miserable instruments of promoting and practicing that species of seduction and immorality which they themselves were the victims. While the relatively extensive account of the euphemistically named woman of the town given by the German historian Johann Wilhelm Archenholz in his Picture of England focuses principally on the lavish world of the exclusive bagnios and rich abbesses of King's Place um, near um, St. James's, um, he does briefly confront the desperate circumstances of the less fortunate victims of the sex trade, and fortunate there is used in extremely relative terms. I beheld with a surprise, mingled with terror, girls from eight to nine years old make a proffer of their charms, and such is the corruption of the human heart that even they have their lovers. Towards midnight, when the young women have disappeared and the streets become deserted, then the old wretches of 50 or 60 years of age descend from their garrets and attack the intoxicated passengers, who are often prevailed upon to satisfy their passions in the open street with these female monsters. So Blake is not entirely out of keeping with other accounts of London here. And London in the late 18th century is pretty horrific in many respects. What is striking in Blake's poem then is not so much that it represents the negative effects of child labour and prostitution, but it makes these its major tokens for representing London existence. Aspects of the city which topographical writing, treatises and travel writing depict as problematic threads in the larger tapestry of the city become, in Blake's poem, the factors that reveal its quintessence as a city of division. 
Colhoun and Phillips see the social problems they discern as fixable. The plate description of the chimney sweep goes on to note that, happily for the cause of humanity, a society has lately been established to alleviate the misery of these unfortunate beings by the adoption of a mode of sweeping chimneys by a machine, which, upon the examination of several intelligent persons, has been highly approved. Arkenholtz places the woman he describes outside London's community, regretting their plight but excluding them from continuing consideration. Blake, though, while less explicit in his detail than the prose treatises, makes London wholly about those it binds and excludes, refusing to pass beyond the shock of oppression. His poem rejects gradualist notions of development and the systems which other accounts implicitly place their faith in. While longer texts are Crete and Caveat, and it's, in, it's sort of important that these sort of very bleak moments in uh, Arkenholtz's account and in um, modern London are small moments in larger thing, guys which are very positive about the city, bleak determines judges and ceases, setting the city's corruption in stone. Bleaky and definitiveness is not the only mode in which poetry considers the late 18th century city. While Blake's poem resolves the city clearly and briefly, Wordsworth's account in the Prelude makes much of both of the city's attractive superficiality and of its tendency to overwhelm. He finds the sum of all that he finds distressing about the city in the yearly celebrations at Bartholomew Fair. Um, this is the illustration of Bartholomew Fair from the microcosm, which I'll come to in a second. What a hell for eyes and ears, what anarchy and din, barbarian infernal. Tis a dream monstrous in colour, motion, shapes, sight, sound. Below the open space, through every nook of the wide area, Twinkles is alive with heads. The midway region and above is thronged with staring pictures and huge scrolls, dumb proclamations of the prodigies and chattering monkeys dangling from their poles, and children whirling in their roundabouts with those that stretch the neck to strain the eye and crack the voice in rivalship, the crowd inviting, the foons against the foons, grimacing, writhing, screaming, him who grinds the the hurdy-gurdy at the fiddle weaves, rattles the salt box, thumps the kettle drum, and him who at the trumpet puffs his cheeks, the silver collared negro with his timbrel, equestrians, tumblers, women, girls and boys, blue-breeched, pink-vested with towering plumes, all movables of wonder from all parts are here, albinos, painted Indians, dwarfs, the horse of knowledge and the learned pig, the stone-eater, the man that swallows fire, giants, ventriloquists, the invisible girl, the bust that speaks and moves its goggling eyes, the waxwork, clockwork, all the marvellous craft of modern Merlins, wild beasts, puppet shows, all out of the way, far fetched, perverted things, all freaks of nature, all Promethean thoughts of man, his dullness, madness, and other things, all jumbled up together to make this parliament of monsters. So, this is in contrast, there's a rather more benign image um, created by Auguste Pugin and Thomas Rowlandson for Ackerman's Microcosm of London. For Wordsworth, Bartholomew Fair is a place of painful sensory overload, a deluge from which it's impossible to draw ordered connections. A location which might, in other hands, symbolise London's energy and its role as a meeting place for myriad people of different races and creeds becomes, in Wordsworth's hands, a chaos on which no limits can be set, um, a community that's lost the possibility of signifying. While the microcosm is also more cautious about Bartholomew Fair, it aims for a more positive representation. So the microcosm is an enormously expensive, lavishly illustrated publication. So it has 104 hand-coloured aquatint plates um, and then texts sitting alongside them. It retails for 15 guineas, which is probably well over a thousand pounds if you do the conversion. So it's plates and so it's really marketed to an, a select audience of quite privileged people. Its plates and their descriptions focus principally on state institutions, finance, commerce, religion and the arts. So it touches on the less fortunate, mainly through charitable institutions. It represents the courts quite significantly. There's several um, plates of prisons. Um, however, there are fruitful and interesting tensions within and between the plates and texts which the microcosm contains. Um, John Mee, who's worked a bit on the microcosm, suggests that the project displays a definite intention to celebrate a glorious collaboration of culture and commerce in the modern metropolis, but also contends that the strains of telling a positive story about 19th century London show in William Henry Pine's commentary and in the tensions between Pugin's <coughs> architectural spaces. Pugin is the person who does the buildings. He's also the father of the guy who builds the present-day Houses of Parliament, um, and Thomas Rowlandson's figures there. So in this Bartholomew prayer, fair plate, you can kind of see the contrast there between the sharp lines of the, plate, of the buildings, particularly on the right and in the background, and the sublime sky with its moon, and then Rowlandson's Roland, roistering crowd at the bottom, both vivacious and ridiculous. And the opening of Pines, who is the person who writes the text of the first two volumes of the microcosm, um, description of the plates renders, registers a similar kind of ambivalence. The annexed plate is a spirited representation of this British Saturnalia, 
To be pleased in their own way is the object of all, some hugging, some fighting, others dancing, while many are enjoying the felicity of being borne along with the full stream of one mob, others are encountering the dangers and vicissitudes of forcing their passage through another, while one votary of pleasure is feasting his delighted eyes with the martial port of Rolla and the splendid habiliments of the virgins of the sun, another disciple of Epicurus is gratifying his palate with all the luxury of fried sausages, to which he's attracted by the alluring invitation, walk into my parlour. The ambitious who, seated in triumphal cars, uh, are by the revolutions of a wheel like that of fortunes raised to the highest pinnacle of human wishes, look down with scorn on the little grovellers below, reckless that they gain their dangerous elevation at the hazard of their neck, and that by another turn of the wheel they must sink to the base level from which they arose. So this is obviously a description featuring some mocking and mock heroic elements. Pine asserting his classical education here somewhat condescendingly to frame the principally lower class tendency of the, uh, tendency of the fair. Um, well, while he stands a little in his superiority, there are also elements of celebration here, I think, and he's linking the life of London with long-established verities. Bartholomew Fair, of course, has a long history going back to the medieval period. It's, there's the Johnson play, Bartholomew Fair. I think it's finally got rid of only in the 1850s. Um, so Pine's description with its classical parallels and its controlled list is ordered and ordering in a way that contrasts with Wordsworth's more chaotic description. In Wordsworth, Bartholomew Fair is the ultimate symbol of London's overbearing excess. It's the points where he throws up his hand and says, I cannot understand London. Um, in the microcosm, it's a bright part of an ordered procession, one of 104 plates. For Wordsworth, the fair is something that must be passed through and ultimately rejected in favour of a more finite and controlled set of rules and pleasures. In the microcosm, it's an attraction, not something repulsive, a token of the wildness of the city, but ultimately something that can be restrained and placed within a wider representational and commercial system, which offers opportunities rather than malignity. So while Blake's city of oppression and Wordsworth's city of confusion are different in many ways, they do have one thing in common. They're both versions of London which are not readily available at the time they're written. The prelude in which Wordsworth's description of Bartholomew Fair comes up is not, re is not published until 1850, and Songs of Innocence and Experience is a tiny circulation um, until the late Victorian period. So the, the fact that these Londons are the touchstones of how we think about Romantic period London is in some ways problematic, not necessarily in all respects, but it's worth acknowledging that there are other more engaged and rambling textual cities which remain there for us to explore and which digital methods can show to us. London was both better and worse than Blake and Wordsworth will admit, both in its communities and its range of representational possibilities. In Robert Southey's Letters from England, which is a, a guidebook that he writes from the perspective of a, Sp a Spanish visitor, Don Manuel Alvarez Espriella, he initially finds the possibility of knowing the city almost inconceivable. I began to study a plan of London, probably not Howard's plan, probably something rather smaller, but nevertheless, though dismayed at the sight of its prodigious extent, a city a league and a half from one extremity to the other, about half as broad, standing upon level ground, it is impossible ever to become thoroughly acquainted with such an endless labyrinth of streets, and, as you may well suppose, those who live at one end know little or nothing of the other. Espriella, though, ultimately finds much in the city that delights and surprises, as well as a number of things of which he disapproves. A romantic period London scale means that defining the limits of its communities will always be a task that pushes at the limits of representation, particularly 200 years after the fact. The writing and art from the period that seeks to represent the city is more various and interesting than a restricted literary reading would imply. While rhetorically rejecting the city was a powerful mode for pushing the limits of sympathy, those like Richard Horwood, Fors, Phillips, Ackerman, Pugin and Rowlandson who embraced the metropolis have valuable things to show us too. Thank you. Mm.